extend my hearty welcome uh, to Professor Chandrasekhar S. Pucha, Professor California State University, Fuller Pratt Campus, California. I'll read the profile of uh, Professor. Sir is uh, employed in California State University from August 1981 to present as a professor. Chair of Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering, Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. Before that, Sir worked in West Virginia University from 80 to 81 and Central Building Research Institute, Roorkee, India from 1979 to 80. Before that, GP Pant University of Agriculture and Technology. Pant Nagar, India from 1976 to 1979. So it goes, start, sir, after his uh, graduation, he started to work in 1974. He is continuing, continuing his service till now. So meantime, we requested him to visit our university. Actually, we invited him to deliver a short course. Meantime, this year it is not possible because of his uh, busy schedule. But he is agreed to give a guest lecture to civil engineering students. And afternoon he is uh, discussing with faculty members uh, regarding research and teaching methodologies. He is going to advise to our faculty members. So on behalf of Veltech University, I welcome once again Professor Chandrasekhar Bucha and he will continue his uh, lecture now. Talk later. Once again, let me give you a very quick background and then uh, and then I'll tell you what it is involved in this. It's about 45 minutes, one hour and a half. And uh, I won't take too much of it. See, generally, they say the attention span of the people is about 10 minutes. After that, they forget what they do. Okay? So I want to, whatever I want to say, I'll capture in the beginning. And then we'll, I have never, I've taught for now, let me, first, let me get you, before I go a little bit into going. Uh, Having taught for the last, I did my PhD, I did my, I did my B, uh, Bena, what should I have edited? BS in civil engineering from uh, IIT, now it's IIT BHU, it was the Institute of Technology, 69, then it the Masters in PhD in Mighty Carpo. Uh, then I went abroad as a postdoctoral fellow, then I came back and worked in Pant University of Agriculture Technology, then I went to Rootkey. Central Building Research Institute as assistant director in the Department of Structures. Then I went back to the United States in 1979. And then I've been there since then. So I've been overall after my PhD about 40 plus years. Uh, I now, uh, I just teach, teach just like that. I don't look at anything. It's not dragging, except for I give the classes. Like this time I came from the United States in May 25th. And I'm going back on July 24th. For the eight weeks, I've been teaching five, uh, five weeks. Two weeks, I taught at IIT uh, BHU in the area of the, the quality improvement program, and that's uh, and I did a course on reliability and uh, reliability analysis and risk analysis. Then I did a two-week course, structure analysis at Geetam. Then after this, I'll take care of a few things in my village. Then I'm going to one week to the end program at IIT Indo. So all these lectures now, the good people ask me whether your next day two hour lecture, do you prepare? No, I don't. You know, if I prepare then I'm dead. Every week and every day what I'm doing is teaching. Is reading first, then teaching, looking at the book. So I feel that after this many years of teaching, if I cannot talk without looking at it, there's something wrong in what I studied, there's something wrong in whoever taught me and myself. Anyway, the reason I why did I give you take all this is because that's why this whole thing is not that I'm going to read the line by line. I will not. Just give basic idea and then move on. At the same time, it cannot be too technical because there are people from different disciplines. People will those off by the time I'm done. So now, having done this, let me quickly go back and go to the subject. The PhD I did in 1975 in the area called, in my PhD thesis was reliability based optimal design of places concrete beams. So if you look at it, there are two things there. Uh, concrete, so it is as civil as you can get. There's no question about it. Look at the two areas, reliability and optimization, they are as, as general as you can get. Okay. And that process, all disciplines, uh, you can apply it to civil engineering, you can apply it 
mechanic phone, we can apply it to electric pump, we can apply it wherever you want. And so the, remember that thing, that's where, so when I joined my PhD way back in, uh, when did it, 71 to 74, 5, uh, my professor gave me an option whether I should go to, how many people are seven engineers here in this group? All of you are civil? Oh, okay. So, oh, all of you are civil. Okay, so that time the professor gave me an option whether you want to do in typical civil engineering like water condensation shop or you want to do in the laboratory. I said, I'd like to go into the laboratory and restaurant. Then you should take some more courses. I took courses in the mathematics department and then moved on. So that was good, a good decision I made because uh, in the United States, most of the companies, uh, aerospace, especially aerospace, they have different departments for reliability and safety. The very good thing, the smartest thing I ever did by going to that area. They are very selected people, maybe in the whole of the United States, there are maybe 300 people, and you work in that area, and uh, that is good. Uh, and I did comes after civil engineering, as I said just now, uh, there are two areas I said reliability and optimization. There is as general as you can get. They cross all disciplines. So there are big basic companies called uh, uh, Boeing, Ultra Grumman and all these aerospace industries, and they get a lot of their projects from NASA. So I worked there for about 10 years. So as a professor, the faculty, whether you are a professor or not, doesn't matter, uh, you are allowed to do consulting work 20% of the time, five days a week. So one day a week you are allowed to do consulting. So I used to work at Boeing for about uh, 10, 10 years I worked. One day a week, I'd go in the morning, come in the evening. So you get paid. So I did something good because company doesn't care if they are a professor or not. What is it that you are doing? The project I worked on was the space shuttle, uh, the one that brought them back and they went to the moon and all that. So when you look at the space shuttle, it consists of a lot of components. You have to look at the reliability of it. And there are a lot of process centers, they coordinate with each other. And then and only then the, the shuttle takes off. So I worked in that. Of course, I'm taking typical civil engineering courses like structure analysis and all that. I also teach a one week. I mean, every week I teach a course called reliability and optimization. So all the experience that I gained from, from Boeing and all that, I could use it in my own classroom. That was good, good course. You get some extra money. You work with industry. And uh, so instead of teaching some mundane theoretical things, you bring some practical things. Anyway, so that's how the, the area it is. It's a very good thing that I took. Uh, I worked in that area. It's used a lot in a lot of uh, uh, places in the United States. In fact, all of the country, all of the world, actually, people are using now. There are laboratory groups, risk analysis, and all that. So the good part about that thing is that you can apply these principles. We'll go to the basic thing into to any particular uh, discipline. So the first time when I worked at uh, Boeing get, to get the consulting work, I sent my resume. I was a little scared that they may not pick me up because they are thinking I'm also an engineering person. And then I told the guy that, you know, whatever I can do for civil structures, you can do the same thing for aerospace. So he got convinced and gave me the job. Then after I'm sure I'm doing something good. So it continued for 10 years. People used to say, you know, some Indian people, oh, good, it's good for you to come every week, something, and you do something and go back. I'm doing something which is useful to them, right? They don't care. What do they care about a professor? They say, okay, you can sit in your place. So I'm doing something useful, and we did those things. So it was nice. Now going back to the main idea of the Los Angeles, it uh, says here, yeah, Cal State Fullerton. Fullerton is about 40 miles south of uh, Los Angeles, southeast of Los Angeles, and about 10 miles from Disneyland. So I've been there since uh, 81, and uh, our tipping, typical teaching load is about uh, eight courses per year, but the contact hours is about 12 hours per week. We teach typical civil engineering courses, uh, fundamentals like statics, dynamics, strength of materials, and all that. Then I also teach uh, one graduate course every year, uh, every semester, actually. Even when I was the chairman of the department, I could assign my own course, but I definitely want to teach graduate course. What is so great about it? It's a little inconvenient in this sense. The graduate classes are held once a week. They were contacted for a particular course, they were 40 hours. Okay, one and a half, one hour, 15 minutes per day, like I mean, two days a week. Two and a half times 16 weeks, 40 hours. Or you teach uh, three hours to two and a half hours per week, times 16. Uh, the classes, since we cater to the graduate students, uh, we have to have graduate classes, most of them, in the night. 7 to 10. So by the time you go home, it's like 11 o'clock. 
little inconvenient, but it's fun to teach graduate courses with the use of brain a lot. For me, I teach, I've been teaching two graduate courses. One is matrix quantum circuit analysis, the other one is the reliability analysis. It's nice because graduate course students are very uh, more responsible than undergraduate students. Here you use the word of postgraduate, we don't use that. All the students who are doing bachelor's, we call them undergraduate. Anybody who is doing master's, we call them graduate students. Here the concept is graduate, postgraduate. Anyway, that's what it is. So it's nice to teach, it's a little tough. Uh, when you teach a night class and go home. Now, having uh, come back to that, now let us see, uh, uh, go further. Okay, first, so the thing is, before we go, let's go, uh, go further. These are five. Let's go on. Go on. Okay, let's stop right here. Now we'll go with the elaborate. So, as I told you, I did my PhD in reliability and risk analysis. Reliability and risk can be connected together. But what is exactly reliability? Okay, because you take this this particular uh, desk. Okay, you put a load on it. Say it's made of wood. Its strength will depend upon uh, on the material that it's made of, whether it is steel or concrete or wood or whatever. Then you start putting the load on it. After some time, it's going to fail. So reliability is nothing but the probability of the survival of that either component or a system under load. So here we have you will. Two terms. Sorry, go back to the equation. Uh, is for punches, I don't protect this one. How do you put the light here? Either the punches. It's just one second. Uh, so let us see. So we're going to the basic concepts, obviously. One semester course cannot be taught in half an hour or something. I'll give you a basic idea so you have some terms that you'll know. So let us see this one now. So, so what did I say just now? If you take this particular table, at the same time, put the load is going to fail. So there are two words that are coming here. One is called S, the strength, the other is called the load. So anytime the strength is greater than the load, the thing will survive. Yes or no? Okay? But this particular one, suppose say it has, uh, uh, it has certain strength, I keep putting the load, and this one is more than the load, it will survive. That's called reliability. So the use to the one time we have called probability. So reliability different uses the concepts of probability of studies. It's a high, a nice term. The basic understanding is you cannot do any reliability analysis unless you know basic concepts of probability and statistics. So there's a word that can be reliability is probability is a strength greater than the load. You all agree that greater than the load it is called. Conversely, the probability of failure is probability that the strength is less than the load. Okay, that's how the basic concept is. So now, so, so what happens is, when you say reliability, we are talking of, uh, there are two kind of analysis. One is called deterministic analysis, the other is called <coughs> probabilistic analysis. Deterministic analysis, everything is fixed. There is no uh, uncertainty there. But in a probabilistic analysis, the outcome of any particular event is uncertain. Nobody knows. Suppose that you don't know if it's going to rain tomorrow or not. So this kind of a thing is problems. So when you say probabilistic, then you bring the concept of random variable. Okay? Because the outcome is random. There is uncertainty involved. So whenever you talk of random variables, then you are talking of distributions. You know, your God. Most very most familiar one is the normal distribution. In your uniform distribution, normal distribution, beta distribution, and on and on. But definitely, a variable will have, a random variable will have some parameters associated with it. Normal has two parameters called mean value and standard deviation. Uniform also has a, uniform goes like this, there is limits A and B. Similarly, beta has something, but all these things are always connected, going to connect it to a normal distribution because normal, as the name says, it is used a lot, but everything can be connected. So, don't forget this. So, this is the library. I'm interested in calculating. So, what happens is, when you say strength, now let's go back to civil engineering, uh, when you take say reinforced concrete beam, okay, ultimate moment, we'll have a function of strength of concrete, strength of steel, weight, depth, and so on and so forth. But now what happens is all those parameters, they're all probability, strict quality, each one has a distribution. You combine them and then get a distribution for the resistance. It's not a single parameter, it's a function of a lot of parameters. Then the load, you've got dead loads, no load, live loads, and all. And the distribution for this. 
Now the question, how do you calculate this? I'll show you in a few minutes. There is a, uh, when you can plot these distributions, you use a thing called the histogram, then you use uh, uh, first you do visual observation, and go with that test, no? And then you take a square test and see whether it is right or not, and then you go, or main interest to calculate the intersection of the two distributions. Now let's move on. Okay, move on. Okay, now what happens is, this is the key. Many of the reliability books have this picture embedded in it. So, this is the biggest is the strength, the smallest is the load. Okay? Stresses. You can apply stress and then the inherent stress that you have. If this is the strength, it doesn't matter. If you, take, you can combine the load and the movement uh, units, but you can always take one unit. Suppose you take a, it's an axial one, take a P, divide by area, you get stress. So you have here applied stress. And this is the inherent one, the strength. So now if you look at it, this, this distribution, how do you get this distribution? Suppose you go and take strength of concrete. Say, I'm using the American thing. You have to use cylinder strength, you people use the cube strength. Right? So let us say you take, you are interested in, in, in uh, uh, the designing a building, you want to use the building strength of concrete of 3500 PSI. So you are building a building, and the inspector comes and checks the quality of it. So if you go into cast 100 cylinders, then you will not get that point in case. It could go anywhere from that 300 to 3600, some number of it, based on the uh, quality that you are using. Okay. Of course, you use cement for aggregate, cross aggregate, sand, water, and all. Okay, so, and then the way you do compaction and all that, it also depends 28 days strength or 7 days strength, but overall, it converts. So those are the kind of things that you do. Then what do you do? How do you get a curve like this? You go and then do a histogram and then look at it and see. And you can take the mid values and you can plot this and you can plot this. Then, it's not normal just because I'm saying it's not. There are some adequacy tests you have to do. One is called, two tests are important. One is called a chi-square test. The one is called a graph but now test. So chi-square test is more popular. So there's the way that you divide the whole thing, get the chi-square value, and then depending upon the confidence level that you want, you can go and check whether it is less than a certain uh, amount which is there on the standard tables. If it is, then it is not for other it is not. Let us say it is not for distribution for these two. Then, if you look at this portion, the stress, applied strength is more than the other strength is more than this. What does it mean? Here in this zone, there is a failure. The thing failed. There is no interest in calculating this failure probability. So now that's when the probability is a multiple integral, the whole thing, the probability is really so difficult to get it. What happens is when you take the density function of normal distribution, it goes something like e to the power minus half, x minus mu, all that stuff. You cannot get the cross form integration for it. You cannot get a value for it. So people use what you call standard normal distribution tables. So what you do is take it, take a particular variable, you standardize it by subtracting x minus mu by sigma for a z value. Then there are tables for z. So you go and then then you can say what is the probability of a particular thing exceeding or, or less than that. For example, take the, somebody does like this and then the guy calculates the probability. Forget about this two more. Let's take any one of them. And the, the probability of strength is greater than 3500. Let us say it comes out to the point 2. So the guy will say, look, you're your uh, specimens are poor quality. It is not giving you a nice higher probability, at least more than 0.8. So, discard the whole thing and then use a better uh, quality control. Something like that. Okay? So, so, this is our aim is to calculate this probability. So this is function of all these integrals. It's very difficult to calculate this integral. So, we use the basic concept for the uh, reliability index, safety index. So, that, for that, what you do is, we we'll go back to uh, what happened, okay? So don't forget now, yeah, money, yeah, show me this one. Again, let's forget. Uh, yeah, yeah, start again. This is what I meant by strength. Okay, I am interested. I'm interested in calculating this value property without using the multiple integrals. So that's why they call the UIP strength index. Okay, so this is the UIP strength index. So this is the UIP strength index. Okay, 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 so this is the UIP strength index. Uh, yeah, the way that you do it is take that. Remember, we had the equation 
probability of reliability is fp, probability of s greater than r. What is the failure problem? S less than r. So what is the constraint that you have? S minus r. S minus l zero is the limit. One side you've got failure, other side you've got uh, success. So you take that and then if you plot it as a single unit, so those two curves go up again. Yes. So our Bible is this. Go back again, I want to this is the stress. And this is the strength. If you look at it, take from here. This is more than this, yes or no? So this is the failure. I'm interested in this value probability where the resistance, when I say, so the resistance greater than less than R is the failure probability. The resistance itself is a function of a lot of variables like sense of concrete, strength of state, and all that. You get that? So you take all those integrals, it's, it's a big problem. So if you take this whole thing represented by a single uh, plot, then there is a, to the left of it is a failure problem. So you are measuring from this failure zone, there is a thing called beta. Okay? So the farther you are from the failure, the safer you are. And that beta will come from what of the Okay? Good. So the way you do it, this is your G, G that S minus R. Take the mean value of it, take the standard deviation, the ratio of it is this. Typically, it is nothing but a, a measurement of how far it is in the failure zone. Suppose there is a failure here. You will run so far that you don't want to get engulfed. So the higher the value, the standard is about 3.0 is the beta value. The safer is the structure. So people use this. Why is this called first order second movement? Because the Taylor series, we go and expand, you neglect all the other terms taking the linear one. So that's called the mean value, and this is sigma. Sigma is the variance, sigma is standard deviation, so which is the second moment. First moment is the mean, the second moment is the, is the variance. So R square root standard deviation. So first order. First order because you have neglected the higher order term the C. So your first order, second moment. So this gives you some basic idea how say it's right. Typically in structural engineering, People in the old days, they used to do factor safety. By, it can be shown by reliability methods that increasing the factor of safety does not increase the safety of the structure. So the safer, the more realistic thing to do is to do a, a probabilistic analysis. So our aim is to now, given it, and then this particular one, as I told you, suppose you take ultimate movement. Okay. Ultimate movement, yes. so, Take the ultimate moment, it's a function of so many variables. Okay? Strength of concrete, strength of steel. So you can do the uh, typical partial derivative method and get the sigma and get the sigma. And then get the sigma. So that is our okay. wrong standard method. So like that you can apply. So there are but so what is that I'm saying? You're interested in the intersection. But if, if, and then you introduce the alternate concept of beta, the safety. So if resistance and load are normal distribution, then you have the cross form expression for beta. Similarly, resistance and the load are not normal, you have the cross form expression for beta. So people, use, if any other ones are there, you have no choice but to use that multiple integral. Okay, now that's what I'm saying. There are also other methods called, let's start a second move. So now, what is this I'm talking about? The reliability analysis, there are uh, three uh, methods that are used, typically. One is called the reliability block diagram, one is called the analysis, and the failure modes of analysis. Let's talk about this an interesting one. I'll talk as much as I can on this one. The reliability block diagram means you take the whole thing and you take the schematic diagram and then use the reliability block diagram. The reliability block diagram, you use the basic concept of a series system and a parallel system. Because in real life, you have got a mixed system. So what is a series system? In a series system, you are supposed to, all the components are supposed to work with before the function, before the, the system works. Any failure of any component is going to result in a failure. So in this case, the gravity of the system, the movement of component to the system. Because naturally, we don't we just use the component. Because you take a special, it is tens of millions of components that you have. Okay, now let's take the our real life. 
Then you say, take a car. You know, the, the car works, works means it moves. You have to, the tires have to work, the engine has to work, right? Any lights, for example, one of the lights doesn't work, you can still drive. So, so in this case, the reliability of the series system, all of them have to work. For example, take an example of a car, it has to, all of them have to work before the car goes on the road. So in this case, there is no redundancy, but the reliability of the system is, the product of the reliability. Suppose I take a three system, three component reliability system, so each one is 0 0.9, the reliability of the system will be 0 0.9 into 0 0.9 into 0 0.9. 0.7 to 9. It's very low. So in order that, say in the project that Boeing does, the NASA gives them a target reliability of say 0.9999. The whole thing goes all over the map. So you have to do it in such a way that each component, the other one will use what is called the meantime between failure, which is one over lambda, it connects with the exponential distribution. Then from bottom if you go up, you should be able to get that reliability. Anyway, so in this case, so in order that there is no redundancy, reliability of each component has to so high, it's almost impossible to manufacture a component. That now let's go down. Let's go down. No. The reliability of the, the series. Yeah, this is called parallel system. Even if one of them works, it's perfectly fine. In this case, the reliability is uh, nothing but 1 minus. Okay, I'm going to use an expression here. Go down. There's a sigma here. 1 minus the product of the failure properties. Now that means, now let's take a simple example of our uh, our body uh, is it a parallel system or is it a, or is it a series system? So one by one, God has given us two eyes. So if one of them goes, sure you feel bad, but you can still work. Two, two, uh, yes. Uh, two kidneys. People are going to dialysis; they can live for years and with one one liver, right? And one brain, right? So I was giving a lecture somewhere in. In uh, New Jersey, in technology, they were saying, why the God has not given two brains? I wish he had given two brains, but he has not given a redundancy. Okay? So, the liver part, one liver is gone, you are finished. So, you need some kind of a door, I don't know. So, in our own physical system, God, ours is a mixed system. The series, some of them are series, some of them are parallel. In the sense that uh, there are two eyes, most of them are there, God has given redundancy. The one eye is gone. Nobody likes it, but you can still function. But you have only one liver. So similarly in the case of a structure, if you can have redundancy, that is really good. But then you get higher reliability. In this case, reliability is nothing but, as I said, one minus the product of the value flow. What happens here? Suppose you take three components again, 0 0.9, 0 0.9, 0 0.9. And the reliability will be each one is 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 1 minus of 0 0.1 into 0.1 into 0 0.1. So the reliability is, is pretty good. Then the reliability of the, the system is actually more than the reliability of the individual components. Whereas in the case of the reliability of the series system, I told you series 0 0.9, 0 0.9 to product, 0 0.729. The reliability of the system is less than individual reliability. So like it, but in real life, it is nothing but you have a mixed system. Go down. How much time I have? I don't know. So anybody know what time I'm supposed to wrap up? Huh? How much time? 15 minutes. 15 minutes? Okay. So that's fine. 15 minutes. Somebody told me something. Either I can speak for hours and then people will sleep. Okay? So we don't want to. So next time. So that is what we do. So then what happens is this is called the parallel system. The real life, but all the bit. You have mixed it. Then you have a mixed system. Everybody can look at it. Then the other one you use what is called a Fail with modes, effects and all this. There's another way. I told you three things, don't forget. One is the reliability block diagram, the other one is FMEA. All these things are used here. These are all not in vocational knowledge, but you use them in companies and then practical implementation. Okay. As I told you earlier, there are two, two uh, areas, reliability and optimization. Optimization, I have not seen separate divisions. At least, I have not seen in different companies. There are definitely Dividends of reliability and safety in the case of uh, many companies where there are people working, but they all have to work in interaction with the design team uh, because uh, you see how these things were manufactured, how they are put, how do you connect the reliability diagram comes from the people from designing the
my colleague Ramana was basically an engineer. But I was working in the, in the Boeing. My job was to do a lab analysis. We get all the information from Strictest people who have uh, built a system. Then we do the plot diagram and then see what is the reality of the whole system. For example, there are, uh, there, for example, the random failure is supposed to be exponential distribution. Exponential is one parameter called lambda, which is the failure rate, which is connected to mean time minute failure, one over lambda. All these things is what we did in a one week course for the quality improvement program at IIT Gates recently. So even otherwise, of course, I don't have to look at that, how the fundamentals are written. Okay, now, now the failure mode spectrum, what we do there here is, you go and look at the criticality of each component, and then you can calculate the failure mode. What are the modes in which the component can fail? Okay, and then you go and then divide, go with the, the failure mode and failure reliability, as you know, they're connected. R is equal to nothing but one minus of P. So let's move on. Actually, if I go through this, I'll be here till evening. So let's move on. Uh, okay. So now, and also there is another one called software reliability. We need some more kind of software reliability. That depends on the program you know. I'm going to skip all this. See, then there's what you are talking about criticality index, and then you compare the criticality indices of various components, and then come up with the, with the system. Now, the, yeah, this is all, these are all some of them we got published in the next year. I'm going to use our software library. I'm going to move more and more. Okay. Yeah, we took a simple example of a quadratic equation and tried to see how you apply the software. Uh, more. Okay, now, uh, yeah, for this one we had a consulting work for the NASA system, the law, it's like a plot diagram, called a reliability plot diagram, you're supposed to get the reliability of the whole system. So this is the one that went into the space, you know how they have it, solid rocket booster, the liquid rocket, the whole thing is, look at the picture, they send it, they shoot it off, and then it goes to orbit, and does whatever you're supposed to do, and then, Disintegrates into the ocean. They don't want all that coming and naturally destroying houses and all that. And there are a lot of places where we did that. This is one of the Kennedy Space Center in Texas. I went there, I didn't see the exact launching, but I went and saw the satellite system. We move on now. So this is, this is all, I got money back. This is the an aerospace system. We look at the solar land valves. How did I get this? This comes with the design engineering. Once we get this, then capture the reliability. We use our basic now. I don't know how to read all this. I have a copy of this. Somebody wants to take a look at it. There are all the things we need. How it can fail. Uh, what are the possibilities of this failure and all. Now move on. And all this one or one is with all the negative. More. Uh, all we are saying is how many walls are there? How it can fail? What happens if one wall fails? Does it trigger in the other system and all that? All this we got some funding and we have some group of research people working. We have went oh now this was what is this? Application to reliability principles. So this one, can somebody make it? Can somebody make it? Somebody, nobody can make it. Can you do something? Closed, that means it's closed, we can't open it. 
same thing you take in our own house. Take a switch. Maybe it, it, it fails in the on position means you have light all over the night. You can't close the stupid thing. It doesn't on, so there's been no light. So it fails on position. Or uh, here it then open or close. So then switch you will say failing in the on position or failing in the off position. Off position means you can't on it. On position means you can uh, off it. In the night, whole night, you have the light, you have to sleep. Right? Unless you plug it somewhere. You completely shut up the door. So you look at all those things, then that is the main event. The main event there is the gate fail to open or close. There are all these things, our components of it. What, are the, what is it that the gate made? What gate you are talking? Damn gate. What is it made of? Then the R gate means, what does it mean that R gate? What we are saying is, all the, any one of them happening, the gate is made open. It was an end gate. The R gate is an end gate. And the probability of failure calculation will depend upon the R gate and end gate. And then you can calculate the, this, the failure of the main gate. Eventually it comes out same. Here you get probability of failures. Then you can go and then uh, and then uh, combine it. You still get the reliability. Whether you use the reliability block diagram or you use the, the font trade diagrams, eventually it will come out the same. Okay, so like this we did. Now, uh, and all this we had consulting work with some money from uh, Army Corps of Engineers and uh, at war. Okay, now, this is what I was saying, fault break. Breakdown. Can the main then can us Can we go back to the main presentation? So we can go further. This more, we're not done yet. This is better. Show that one again? Yeah, here. Here it is. This one they can stop. Stop somewhere. Okay. Can stop. It was good. Here it will just stop it. Yes. Can go, huh? Eh? I'm doing something. I'm doing something. Go back again. My mistake. No, I'm doing something. Okay. You did the right there. Right to that. Right. This one. Uh, purple. Yes, right. This one. You should do something better than this. And let it go down, it's okay, let it go down and I'll keep my finger here. Slowly, let it go. Down, down, down. Yeah, yeah here. See, there is a, still our gate. Somewhere here I saw an end gate. More bone. Anyway, there, this is an end gate over here. If you look at it, that means unless these two happen, this won't happen. What does that mean? Suppose you have failure of power in your house. There's a lot of power cuts. I don't know how much it is in, in, in here. But it is rather and on there. Somewhere there. There's a lot of power cut. So you have a generator. So what is the possibility that you will not have power in the house? The main one goes and your generator also goes. And it's an end game. Right? If I want to calculate the probability of you not having current today, the main one goes, the government whoever takes off, and then you have generated also. So that's an end game. So like that you do and then not at four. Like that then you go and do. So the, the properties depend upon the, 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 the mathematical formulation will change depending upon end gate and R gate. Then when you do all these failures, then you go up, then you can connect it to reliability also. Reliability is nothing but one minus probability of failure. So let go. Go more. So, but all this, how can you prepare? unless you talk to the engineering people. The reliability group, as I said, your separate group, they cannot function on their own unless you talk to the people who designed that particular system. Now, uh, okay, I'm going to wrap up quickly. Okay, now, now what is this? Okay, let's talk here. So what I'm going to say is, we have tried the principles of reliability and risk analysis to a lot of areas. The one that you did at the end was aerospace, we apply to civil engineering. Now here, the medical area, okay, is also another area called kinesiology. So this one, uh, stop it, go up again, like it. the one you showed me before. Yeah, okay, that's fine. Yeah, let's start. What is this now? Okay, this one, 
It's called lumbar spine. Everybody, everybody has a spine. And then you have this one, and one, and two, and three, and four, and five, and all that. And young people are fine. As we get older, we get problems with these, uh, these ones. Okay. And this is called. These are called guides. So what is, what is it that is it's come from the general area called kinesiology, okay. body mass index and all that. Also like a medical field. So what happens is people get injured. As you go older, these L1, L2, L3, 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 L3,
Then I get trust, and then I get methodology for the trust model used for the pilot study. The pilot study, the same thing is more. See, I'm using all practice equations. What is this? Action corresponding to the unknown displacement. Action corresponding to unknown displacement in the in the restraint spec here, because in a stiffness method, what do you do? It's a successive locking and unlocking. First lock all the joint and then you release it. This is called stiffness method. Stiffness metric. These are called unknown displacement. Then you calculate the forces. That is how you do stiffness method. So I use the direct stiffness method. Number of forces and all that. Go, go, go. Okay. So then, so here you see. Uh, is I'm just saying the calculation. Okay, okay, now here it says it's not 62. AM2 is the member spine. 58.5% of the key is what the force is in this one. After doing all the what is something? And I think this is how it seems it looks inside us. Why? This is drawn by a medical doctor, physician in our group. So really these are all the guy why. And you showed that 58.5%. We did other work. Anything else? Okay. I think it's over, right? So now, we have other examples. I don't know, I think we could already. We have right this super science. Uh, presidential actions. Okay. How does laboratory come to there? Because they are predicted correctly. Yeah. Presidential actions. Yeah. Presidential actions. Yeah. Presidential actions. Yeah. In Obama became president, 2012 when he got re-elected, 2016, I'm wrong. My uh, prediction said that Clinton will win, but uh, Trump won. But that paper we presented in a political science conference, they are the ones who do all these things. And when I presented it, he was back, they said, don't worry, uh, you are in the right uh, group, because most of them are wrong. But the data was wrong. And how is just one second? How did he say we use reliable analysis there? Rabbit analysis, I told you, is basic random variables. I based it mainly on the false. It's a random variable. The way they do in the United States, you have the false, then you have the primaries, and then you have the candidate coming from me through major parties, and then you have the elections. So false is a random variable. So we have the different polls coming in each state, take that, analyze that, and the United States president becomes not only the popularity vote, he has to win, he has electoral vote. Bring that where they belong. Mind that you very and then ready. Everything was fine. The model was good, but unfortunately, the data was wrong. People were lying. They were going to vote for uh, uh, Trump and they said Clinton. What can it do? When the, when the data is wrong, everything is wrong. So, like that. So, that is how you get the laboratory analysis. They choose because a different field, political science, is a field by itself. Just like engineering, that's a different field. There are professors in it. So we applied and then showed that. The model works two times. Third time is not the model is wrong. So like that, keep on doing in any particular area. Then you want to stop. Then we'll be all right. Anybody has any questions or comments? Yes, sir. How would you do final first find model? How did I find? Uh, yeah, in a frame, you know, degrees of freedom, what is it? You go to each joint. How many ways can it move, right? That's what the degrees of freedom is. Because you just forget about friends. See, you take a beam. It has got n number of multi-degrees of freedom. Not n. Good. How do you calculate? Suppose you take a simply supported beam. Okay? Uh, say you take a proper cantilever. Cantilever here and fix it. What is the, what is the static indeterminacy for this? How do you do? You go degrees of freedom for each joint and you join them up. They are given. Cantilever has uh, zero degrees of freedom. It cannot go horizontal, it can't go vertical. Zero. The roller, actually, it can go. Rotation, there is horizontal displacement. The load is vertical, and the loads are vertical, there is no difference between a beam and a frame. So if you take that, zero here, one here, total is one. So that is the static indeterminacy. Similarly, can so you do like that for each of the joint, and then get the static indeterminacy. Degree of freedom is nothing but the number of ways the joint can. So like that, we calculate it for that frame, and then like Have you validated this model? Yes, validated the model with the data that we found. From the from the Navy group. Anybody else? 
first day. If I have been speaking for two weeks, I would know almost everybody's speaking. Sometimes I may get it wrong, but overall I'll get it.